Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living, mostly condos. And we are on every week, every Thursday from 3 to 3.30, and we hope we bring you helpful and insightful information about association living. One of the issues that has come up over and over again, and in fact is often uh, one of the leaders in uh, requested mediation, is the production of documents to homeowners. Homeowners who live in the association are entitled to know, for the most part, how their association is run and operated, recognizing there are probably some documents if disclosed might violate the fair debt law or might uh, put the association in harm if it's a legal matter. So I've invited one of my really good friends, one of our industry great professionals, Nalan, an attorney, to visit me today. Welcome back to the show, Na. Great. We're going to talk about documents. So remind our viewers a little bit about your background. Great pleasure to be here again. Uh, my name is Nalan. I'm with the law firm Muru Okan Rosenberg. Uh, we specialize on condominium and community association representation, including general matter consulting, collection foreclosure, and litigation matters. And so getting to the, the issue here, because I can tell you as an association manager, over and over and over again, I get email and texts uh, regarding wanting, quote, information, not necessarily documents. Mm -hmm. And we respect the right that owners have a right to know how their association is operated. But looking at the statute, mm -hmm. basically what documents are owners entitled to? There are several types of documents. First, you know, there's the resale of a unit situation. Then, you know, all the, you know, like a project document. Or if it's a leasehold, then master lease or any financial statement, like regarding the association's common elements and financial status. Of course, those are relevant. There are also other uh, documents uh, it's about like operations of the association, like meeting minutes, uh, like association's contract, uh, you know, like, um, you know, um, reserve study, all those kind of documents. But some of the ones I guess, I'm going to throw you kind of a list and you tell me yes or no, or maybe, or whatever it may be, recognizing that an owner has the right to make a request for any document. It just doesn't mean the board has to give it to them. But it does say in the statute mm -hmm. that the board has to answer whether they are going to give it to them or not give it to them, as I read the statute. So they can re an owner can request anything, but the statute is pretty clear what documents are mandated to be given to owners. So let's look at some of the ones that I consider mm -hmm. um, are often misunderstood. So you live in a condo, and I live in a condo, the same condo, and I, Richard, say, I know you live there now, but I want Fred's ledger on his charges and payments for his unit. Can I get another owner beside your own? Obviously, you're entitled to have your own charges and payments made. But can you, can you mandate that the board give you the financial ledgers of another owner? No, that's actually prohibited by the federal law. There's a Fair Debt Collection Act. So the association as a creditor cannot just disclose anybody's uh, delinquency information to a third party without the authorization from that owner. Uh, but the statute does allow the association to give out uh, like a general statement, like summary statements of delinquencies for over 90 days because it does Im impact the association financial situation. Yeah, because yeah, that's basically what most management companies will say. Here is the delinquency list of those unit owners over 90 days. And it specifies the unit and or the owner's name in that list. But it's a general list of all those owners over 90 days and does not include the ones that are less than 90 days. Mm -hmm. And certainly if we received a request saying, I want to see Fred's ledger, all his charges and payments, we would decline to give that to them because it's covered by the fair debt law. Mm -hmm. So how about the other common one I get is the statute says we have to give an owner's list. And they say, well, I want not only the owner's list, which is their address, but I want the email, the phone numbers, and other owner information in addition to just the names and addresses of owners on the owner's list. Do we have to do that? No, that's a misinterpretation. The statute actually only talks about the owner's list, only includes the name of the owners and their address. Uh, so if it's a, like agreement of sale, then you apparently need to know, you know the, the purchaser's name. Uh, but other than that, emails and phone numbers, those are all information that's not required to be produced. Yeah, I think what happens is owners get 
really ab upset about something and they want to lobby the owners. Mm -hmm. And of course, email has become prevalent and they think all the owners have the same interests that they may have in the issue. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we get many phone calls from owners who somehow they did get the email or the phone number not given by the management company, mm -hmm. where the owners are saying, how can I get off this person's list? They're harassing me. They're calling me every day. You know, their, their board meeting's coming up or the annual meeting's coming up, and they're getting 10 emails a day from this person. And our only answer to them is, look, we didn't give it to them, but we suggest you just write them a polite email saying, thank you for your interest in the association. Please take me off the list. Yeah. Because that's about all we can do. But a lot of owners misunderstand the real issue that under the current statute, and in the past, uh, there's been suggestions to amend the law to require email to be given, but none of those have ever passed. So at the moment, it's the owner's name or agreement of sale holder's name mm -hmm. and their contact snail mail address, their address for uh, record purposes, and that's what they can get. So anyway, let's look at the issue of boards go out and they get legal opinions from attorneys on matters. And the owner says, I want to, the board made this decision based on a legal opinion. I want to see the legal opinion. Do they have to give the legal opinion? No, the legal opinions, that's a considered um, a protected attorney-client privileged information because it's a, a, a communication made between, you know, attorney and client in confidence and trying to facilitate or trying to obtain legal advice. Uh, it, unless it's waived by the client, it is always confidential, it's protected. If, you know, the, that the board wants to communicate with the owner about the basis of their decision, it's always good to do a separate, for example, like a, you know, like a newsletter to owners to try to explain the matter or like a memo to all the owners instead of give the original communication. Because once you do that, you basically waive the attorney-client privilege and you also waive uh, you know, the privilege for all and any matters relevant to that communication, which is horrible. Yeah, I think at the end, like you said, the board could elect to waive it, mm -hmm. but more times than not, they're going to want to protect the association, maintain the attorney-client privilege, and then what they're going to want to do is issue a separate statement mm -hmm. or newsletter or document mm -hmm. explaining their opinion, probably approved by the lawyer with that statement that's been issued, yeah. and, uh, and give them some relevant information with respect to it. But um, people think it's really easy, like, well, why did they make the decision we have to have 80% vote to make this change in the condominium? Well, those times, more than not, the summary statement by the attorney will be adequate. But then there are situations where there's a suit with an owner, there's some other fair, um, uh, disability act issue, that because it's still in progress in some form of litigation or dispute resolution, the board may not want all the facts out of the table because they're trying to protect the association. Maybe a lawsuit against the vendor, for example, that they're not going to want to disclose uh, these legal opinions. So it's really a board decision at the end of the day, and they should probably seek the counsel of their lawyer. And yes, what they do that's always under. a good idea. And actually, you know, talking about pending litigation, there's also another doctrine, you know, that is in play, which is the work product uh, doctrine. Basically, if it's something, a material prepared in anticipation of litigation down the road then it gives this broader protection compared with attorney-client privilege. For example, if you get consultant, you know, to work out like some report investigation, and that's, that you do that for the purpose of preparing for potential litigation, it's protected. Unless, you know, the other side can prove it's necessary, I mean, there's gonna be undue hardship. If you don't give it to them, it's also gonna be protected. And oh, yeah. yeah, of course, the most protected category is if it's your legal counsel's, uh, you know, like a summary of their a mental impression that's always protected, actually. And I think the comment when it comes up related to litigation mm -hmm. is that I want to see the copy of the invoices the lawyer sent mm -hmm. with respect to a matter. Mm -hmm. And more times than not, the managing agent will redact that information. Because yes. oftentimes the attorney's description of what he's doing might be foretelling what's all, what, what the issues are, what's going on. Is that Kind yes. of your understanding as well? Yes. Uh, basically, because legal invoices sometimes, depending on how detailed the time entries are, it would include certain privilege communication there. And it's always a good idea to have your counsel uh, you know, review and do the redaction before you just send it out. So the legal side is something that boards who are owners also and have the same rewards and risks of living in an association are doing the best they can to protect the association from potential uh, legal fallout by listening to their attorney and 
and, and, and following his advice with regard to these opinion letters and invoices. Right. The other one that kind of comes up, then I want to move on to a, a law that was just passed and the controversy behind that. But the other one that comes up is owners say, I want bank statements or even the signature cards of when the management company opened the trust account. Mm. And that's not specifically defined in the statute. No, it's not. Yeah. And you see risks in giving bank statements and signature cards? Well, definitely, you know, like sensitive information like your account numbers, like a signature these days, you know, with, uh, you know, internet, cybersecurity is really something, you know, we should keep in mind before we do something before, yeah. So I, I can see a reason why the board would do, do not want to produce that or at least want to redact out all the sensitive info. Yeah, I don't think the statute requires it, but my experience has been having seen bank statements and signature mm -hmm. cards in today's electronic world, mm -hmm. it's easy to steal that signature. Mm -hmm. Or you can get someone's account number if that got in the person, wrong person's hands. Mm -hmm. We saw a recent uh, internet fraud case in one of the condominiums mm -hmm. here in Hawaii where mm -hmm. uh, a third party was able to get access to bank information, was able to take the funds. So even owners who pay electronically, oftentimes there's information that might be helpful to someone they get the access to the owner's bank account information mm -hmm. who made the maintenance fee payment. So mm -hmm. uh, more times than not, most, uh, most um, management companies won't give the bank statements or signature cards. They'll say that the financial statement gives you an accurate representation of how much money we have in the bank. Mm -hmm. Where we've had cases that were pushed a little, we've redacted all of the account number, all the electronic banking information, all the signature information, so that no one could, in essence, use that for some false purpose. Yeah, and for requesting owners, I mean, it's also legal for the association to request you to sign an affidavit, basically, you know, confirming, you know, under the perjury, you're testifying that you're only using the information you're getting for good purpose of like association matters, not for your own personal purpose or do something unrelated to the association business. That's also permissible under the statute. Well, I think the key to me is before we move on to this controversial, which was corrected by the law, uh, House Bill 1498, mm -hmm. um, is it clear to say that owners should be entitled to information? But isn't there a risk of, you know, you know what I see more common than not? An owner will say they're angry. I want to see every record that the law gives me the right to for the last 10 years. <laughs> and they think it's sitting there in some file. But when It may be 50 file boxes of information over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and they think they can get it for free. Uh, is that your experience? Well, that's actually, because this matter is within the jurisdiction of RACO, Regulated Industry um, Office. I mean, there's actually, uh, they have online forums uh, regarding this matter, and if you look at one of the reasons how the association can deny a request is because it is too broad, overbroad. Like in this situation, for 10 years, a lot of the you know, information could be stored uh, off-site on, in a storage space. You know, that means the association has to incur expenses to retrieve those, you know, inf those boxes back and process it and then make it available. It's basically, you've got to be focused. Like, for example, identify the date uh, or the subject matter, what you're interested in. And in, such, in other situations where the association couldn't find your information, they can also offer that you know, hey, the do documents are here, it's available for you to in inspect. But they also have the right to send in a property manager to sit in, you know, to supervise that, and, you know, just to prevent anybody from, you know, changing the record, modifying it without any authorization, yeah. Okay, well, I have a little bit more on this subject, but we're gonna take a short one minute break and come back to how owners can keep the costs from getting out of control when requesting documents. So we'll be right back with Condo Insider in a minute. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we'll tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Welcome to 
Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're sitting here talking with one of my great friends and very professional lawyer, Nalan, about the common misunderstanding between owners and maybe sometimes boards on what documents people are entitled to. And I was, before we took the break, I was summarizing that the common mistake I see is owners will request all the documents that the statute says for the last 10 years. Well, these records are kept in a offsite warehouse. Someone's got to pay to have them retrieved, delivered, refiled back at the warehouse. Documents, they're going to put a property manager in the room with the owner. Because in theory, if there's litigation or problems, we wouldn't want an owner to be able to accidentally take a document they weren't entitled to and, 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 and corrupt the file mm -hmm. or add a document maybe that shouldn't be there. So management companies are very protective to maintain the validity of the files they have in their possession. So there's a cost to that. So as you said earlier, you need to say, these are what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And so when I get a request from the owner, I want to see all the invoices for the last two years. I always suggest they get a check register, then check off those invoices they really want to see because mm -hmm. they pay insurance, electric bills, water, sewer bill, they pay tons of different bills. And this give this broad request, I'm entitled to this under the law, doesn't mean you're not going to have to pay for it. And sometimes it could be $1,000 to get all these records. And that's before you reproduce them. So I would just caution owners to say, yes, you're entitled to these records, but don't do it when you're a hoo-hoo. Think back. What do I really want to see and try to narrow the request uh, to make it reasonable within that, that spectrum? But before I was talking about House Bill 1498, mm -hmm. and one of the most controversial arguments was an owner, because the statute today says they're entitled to contracts. Mm -hmm. And so the association would sign an employment contract with the resident manager, general manager, whatever the title might be. And the owner would say, I want the manager's contract. And the board would say, no, I'm not going to give them the manager's contract. And so this legislature dealt with that in HB 1498. Mm -hmm. So what's the rule today? Uh, so it's a legislative bill. It's in road to the governor for approval. So if, you know, on Monday, we don't hear from the governor's office that he's going to wait to it, so this, this bill will probably become law, and it's going to be effective on Ju July the 1st of this year. Uh, so the new law will be uh, the association has the statutory obligation to also produce uh, management con no, contracts with general manager, on-site manager, resident manager uh, to, the, uh, to the owners. But they are able, they, are, uh, they, they can redact out all these personal information. Uh, let's see, like their birthday, social security number you know, uh, cell phone, like personal emails, all those kind of information. But like uh, the compensation number or the job duty, those you have to leave it in for the owners to review. So to make it clear, because this was the big issue, when this law passes, assuming it does pass, and we'll mm -hmm. know by Monday, because it'll either make the veto list Monday or it won't. Mm -hmm. And I'm speculating it's not going to make the veto list. It doesn't rise to the level of, I think it's going to get that much attention. Mm -hmm. But the key is that a owner who requests it can get the manager's contract, and it must include the compensation package or bonus package. It must include the job description. Yes. In fact, it must include everything except personal information, which is spelled out. Mm -hmm. Because the, the statute clearly says things such as social security number, health information, Actually, his signature on the contract can be redacted. Yes. And so things that would protect his privacy, his bank account number, his passwords, mm -hmm. these types of very personal information mm -hmm. to that resident manager can be redacted. Mm -hmm. But they can't use that redaction as a way to avoid giving the compensation, the job description, and his other duties. That would be a violation of the statute, yeah. That would be a violation. Mm -hmm. And why do you think they passed this law? Basically, I think the purpose is to increase transparency and, you know, because owner as members of association, they have a right to know, like, uh, you know, like how much they're paying their general manager, which is probably the, the person they're dealing with on a daily basis the most. They also want to know, you know, the 
you know, what, what he's in charge of the detailed job descriptions to encourage owner to participate in more on the operation of the association. It was explained to me one time, even though it's not a corporation, I guess it can be a corporation. Mm -hmm. um, we know in the paper, for example, what all the top officials that are publicly traded companies are, Bank of Hawaii, First Hawaiian Bank, those types of entities, we know what the top people make. Mm -hmm. So this particular law focuses on the top person in an association. Mm -hmm. Doesn't include the gardeners and the lower level uh, job responsibility people, it's primarily the main guy at the condo mm -hmm. association. Mm -hmm. And since those owners, I hate to say involuntarily, but they decided to belong to the association, but they have to pay these fees that the budget is adopted by a board, that they're entitled to transparency, know where their money's going. Yes. That's how I look at it. So my advice to all of you out there and uh, your boards of directors is that when you get a request, you have to provide the information. It's, it's simply that, that simple. And I guess my question to you is, can a board say to a management company, I know the law says to provide it, but I'm giving you instructions, management company, not to give it to them? It's a statute, so I think the managing agent has the obligation to comply with it, especially that they are also licensed. So, you know, RACO is going to step in if you, you give that kind of instruction to your agent. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very clear in the law because managing agents are the head person in the company is a licensed real estate broker. Mm -hmm. And there's very specific statutory obligation for a broker, mm -hmm. one being complying with the law. Yes. And so if the law says to a management company, you have to give this document, they would certainly advise the board that particular owner asked for this document. But at the same time, they wouldn't be holding it up waiting for approval. Uh, it's better for to be transparent and and not put roadblocks up for owners. It sends a message like you're trying to hide something. If the statute says give it to them, you give it to them. Yes. And, and, and a management company is not going to be able to say, I took instructions from the board, and they told me not to give it to you, even the law says I'm supposed to give it to you. They're going to create liability for them under a licensing law violation. That's not going to be a valid defense, yes. So, so 1498, number one, deals with management contracts I should say association employee manager contracts. Mm -hmm. Management contracts of managing agents, mm -hmm. now they have to be given to the owners. That's, that's not really debatable and it hasn't been debatable for some time in the industry. So yeah, the yeah. management company contract as a managing agent, they're entitled to that automatically. That's never been controversial as much as in the past, uh, boards would say, well, you know, he's entitled to have his financial situation protected and and that's why we don't give it to them. And now the statute clearly says, well, you have to give it to them. Mm -hmm. and so, so what else in 1498 do? I know it dealt with tenants also. Yeah, it basically prohibits a tenant from serving as a board member. Yes. So if a tenant's on the board now, and this is effective July 1, in your opinion, does this probably create a vacancy on July 2? Yes. Uh, oh, I should quantify that because uh, the tenant, not an owner. I mean, if it, it is a tenant at the same time, it's also an owner of another unit, then, you know, of course, it's allowed, right? Right. It's, if it's only a tenant, not having any ownership interest in the project, then you cannot serve as a board director. And I think that came about because there are entities out there, uh, and some of them are religious entities, that own units, and they rent them for income for their facility or for their organization. and they have put a tenant on there. And in some ways, his interests are different than that of a board. They want to keep the fees really low and maybe not make repairs because they don't want the maintenance fees to go up because then the rent will go up. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the thought behind it, that their interest in the association, because they're not really an owner, they're a tenant that has a really different interest than the owner itself, which may be this particular organization. Mm -hmm. And so what's going to happen is that on July 1, Again, if this law does not uh, meet the veto test, um, it's going to have to create a vacancy and you're going to have to elect another owner, recognizing mm -hmm. that if they're already an owner, they could be elected. Mm -hmm. but I guess it gets complicated because if it's a mixed-use project right. and they were elected by a class of owners, mm -hmm. and so they're elected as a tenant by a class of owners of that organization, mm -hmm. then they're not elected by the common people. It's elected by a class. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I guess that's why we have lawyers, huh? <laughs> to answer all these questions yeah. and what really goes on. So effective July 1, in theory, if the law gets, and we'll know Monday, 
uh, the law goes through, associations that have tenants on boards will have to look at that with the help of their council and determine that probably a vacancy has been created and they will have to appoint to the next annual meeting a replacement uh, owner uh, to fill that slot. Yes, for mixed use projects, uh, you better also look at the new law because there's going to be changes regarding directors' removal process and the election, you know, basically uh, as to whether, uh, you know, if your director is elected by a class, specific class of owners, then they can also be removed or replaced by uh, a majority of that class. Or, you know, if uh, it's a situation where um, the, uh, the association uh, allows the director to be elected by all class of owners, then for associations, if you own a certain commercial unit, you wouldn't be prohibited under the new law to also uh, vote with your ownership in that unit. Basically, you give leverage more power for the association in that yeah, situation. I think from what I've been told, I'm not an expert in this, that clarifies the law that you may have an owner who was elected by a class, but the law is vague on the removal. Mm -hmm. And so people who didn't elect them could then vote to remove them, mm -hmm. even though they ever elected them in the first place. Yeah. And so this law basically says, as to a, even this, a, you can elect by class, but then you have to be removed and reelected by the same class. Yeah. And also, if that particular unit in that class, uh, the board owns that unit because of a, uh, of a foreclosure, mm -hmm. they can vote uh, on those types mm -hmm. of issues with respect to uh, that particular class. Yes. At that point in time, we covered a lot of material, and we're done with our show for this week. And I want to thank Na for always coming. You're always very professional and very knowledgeable on these subjects. Next week, we're going to be talking about this famous well misunderstood problematic of the class action foreclosure lawsuit out there where there's all these rumors about what's really going on whether the foreclosures under non-judicial are legal or not legal what the major issues are in this class action foreclosure lawsuit we have attorney john morris coming in so until then we'll see you next thursday on condo insider aloha